appreciate the opportunity. If you would take your Bibles and let's turn over to Psalm 119. <clears throat> Psalm 119, we're going to look at a few verses here. Psalm 119. You know, a lot of people think that when you become a Christian, that all your worries are over and everything's smooth sailing, and it is com it's completely the opposite. It does, Brother Bruce. It gets harder. And, uh, you know, if you think about the children of Israel, uh, They, 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 would, they would serve God and then, and then they would always turn to idolatry and go, go worship. And, and with all the evidence they, they had, you would think that, Gret, that they wouldn't do that. But we, we do the same thing today. God blesses us and, you know, we go, we'll, we'll go do something else instead of come to church or do something else besides read our Bible or do something else besides pray. And, and it's, it's always the same thing. So, but, uh, you know, they had a bunch of judges even after they, they came out and, and they would do good for a while and then God, they'd, they'd cry out, to, they'd get in trouble and they'd cry out to the Lord and he'd send them another judge. Uh, so to, to say that, that we never have any more problems, some, the, the greatest men in the Bible faced afflictions, uh, trouble, trials. And here in Matthew, Matthew Psalm 119, Let's look at verse 65 through 71. He said, Thou hast dealt well with, with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have uh, believed thy commandments. Look at verse 67. David says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, ha but now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have uh, forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart, their heart is as fat as a grease, but I have delight in thy law. But I delight in thy law. Look at verse 71. Verse 71 is a verse I, he says, it is good. David said, it is good that I, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might, that I might learn thy statutes. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for loving us and dying for us. Lord, I pray that you'd bless this time we have tonight. We thank you for, Lord, we thank you for being so good to us. Amen. Thank you for, for looking after us and watching over our families. Lord, I thank you for blessing this church. I pray for the people and you follow that you'd bless them. I pray that you'd bless tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, we as humans, when you got plenty of money in the bank and nobody's sick... And you, you, and you can say what you want to. You're human like I am. You don't pray as much. And, and listen, you let, somebody, you let the bank account get low or you let somebody get sick. When you get down on your knees and pray, there's a different kind of praying going on. And, and so what David is saying here, and he makes it personal. He says, it is good for me. He says, for me, that I have been afflicted. And if you read that to the average person, they say, man... Something's wrong with them folks. But I can tell you this from personal experience. The, the more trouble that I have, the closer that you get to God. Now, it don't always work like that if you rebel against it. Uh, and and then, then, you, then you think, well, why, why does God allow me uh, to go through certain things? Why does God allow my family members to get sick? Uh, why does he allow me to struggle financially? And, and, and we're human, you say, well, does he not care? Well, then you got to go back and say, well, what has he done for me? And you know what he's done for you? He, listen, God gave his son for us. You, you know, it, it blows my mind, Brother Kenny, that God knew who I was before he created me. He knew every sin that I was ever going to commit. And Brother Grady still created me. Still created me. And he'd already planned to send his son to die for me. He took care of my sins 2,000 years ago. He used his son to fulfill his holy and just demands. And he says, Steve, you can go to heaven. It's hard for me to believe sometimes, Brother Joe, that he wants to have fellowship. He wants me to go live with him in heaven throughout all eternity and fellowship with me. 
So to say that, that, that it's stupid, see, he sends us afflictions. He sends us trials. He sends us trouble. He, he does those things in our lives to draw us closer to himself. To himself. Okay? So David said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. You know, when you get in real trouble, I hope you turn to the Word of God. I hope you get on your knees and pray. You know, affliction or trials, troubles, however you want to call it. Look, look with me over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You know, God, and it, I guess you maybe this isn't an affliction. I think about Noah. God told Noah to build that ark. How many years did it take Noah to build that ark? 120 years. Now, Brother Kenny, do you know what he could have told Noah? Noah, there's a flood coming. When you get up in the morning, there's going to be a big ark sitting out front because I'm going to take care of that for you. But you know that's not what he did? What, 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 did, he, what did he allow Noah to do? Preach 120 years and people got to see that ark come up. Got, got to see Noah. Now, only eight people got on, on, the, on the ark. But, but you, which, if you think about it, is very impressive, was his own family members. In, in 2 Corinthians, uh, I'm really good about telling people to turn to a scripture and never read, read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're talking about, talking about um, you know, God has, God has he, he says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, he never said that you wouldn't have any trouble. And uh, second, second Corinthians chapter four in verse 17. We'll just read this one verse. He says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. See, if, if we we'll allow our afflictions, our trials and, and the things that come up in our life, if, if we will do what God, if we'll, if we'll let it draw, push us toward God or draw us to God, see, we'll have eternal rewards in heaven, rewards in heaven because of that. And, and listen, they only last, if, compared to eternity, even if you get to live 80 years, what does that compare to eternity? You know, and, and these old bodies, you know, I went and seen Paul today. You know, dear friend, sooner or later, we're going to have to lay these old bodies down. And, you know, I told Paul today, I said, man, it's just a matter of time before I go to the doctor. And he, and he tells me something like what you've got, or either I'm going to be out driving somewhere and, and, and the Lord's going to see fit to take me home. But... It's just a matter of time before that happens. And, and so our afflictions, we need to let them work for us. We don't need to get mad with God over them. We need to remember what he done at Calvary for us. Uh, you know, our afflictions, if you'll let it, our afflictions will teach us some lessons. Our afflictions, you know what it'll do? It, it'll... it'll, it'll It'll teach us to learn to trust. Our afflictions, our troubles, our trials will teach us to lean on His Word. And if we allow it, our, our afflictions and our trials, it'll teach us how to pray. I mentioned a while ago, dear friend, see, if everything's going well, we, we say, dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We pray that you'd bless our family. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if somebody, if somebody in our family is sick, I guarantee you Paul Johnson and Renita Johnson, Ms. Gunton back there, they've done a different kind of praying. You know, David, we're going to go back to the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 13. You know, David was by far the best king that Israel ever had. But you know what? David's life was not a smooth 
sailing life. David, uh, matter of fact, in 1 Samuel, we'll, we'll turn over there since they gave me a little extra time tonight. 1 Samuel chapter uh, 13. First Samuel chapter 13 and verse 14. Saul had done disobeyed God and God was telling him he's going to take the kingdom from him. In verse 14 in 1 Samuel 13, are you there? He says, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord is talking to Saul. The Lord has sought him, sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be the captain over his people because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. David was a, was a man after God's own heart. And you know what he'd done for some eight years? Listen, he ran like an animal from Saul. You know what he'd done? He hid in caves. Do you know who allowed that to happen? God did. God did. And, he was a, and who are we to compare ourselves even with King David? You know, if... if you, you know what he was doing? That God was molding David to be the kind of king that he was. Now, he wasn't perfect. No, we're not perfect. And, and some of his heartaches he did bring on himself, just like we do. But, but if we will allow our afflictions, our trials, you know what they'll do, dear friend? They'll mold us. They'll, 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 they'll make us into the person that God wants us to be. He don't send afflictions and trial, trials in our lives just because. You know, he, he don't send trials to Nick Martin and say, well, I'm going to watch Nick Martin sweat today. That's not why he does it. He sends Nick Martin trials to shape him and to form him, to make Nick trust him. That, that's, why, that's why David said, it's good for me that I've been afflicted. And I know to the, to, the, to the man looking from outside, they say, man, that's the stupidest statement I've ever made. But it's not. It's one of the greatest statements that's ever been made. You know, we're, we're talking about David. David, for a few minutes, turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. You know, David had to run from Saul because Saul was after him. And Saul was not after him because they were good buddies and he wanted to give him an award. Dear friend, he was after his head. You know, here David faced Goliath. And we're talking about trials and affliction. Dear friend, if you hadn't had a Goliath in your life, you're going to have one. You're gonna, sooner or later, you're going to have a Goliath. Sooner or later, you're going to have to go in for open heart surgery. And to me, that's a Goliath. Brother, brother, brother Rowan's had a Goliath. Brother Joe's had a Goliath. And several more of you probably have. Losing your eyesight. I would call that a Goliath by far. Not everybody is able to go in and face this Goliath like David did. You, know, you understand what I'm telling you? There's a reason we, as Christians we stay beat down and, and, and defeated all the time. You know what David told him here in 1 Samuel chapter 17? He says in verse 32 of 1 Samuel chapter 17... He says, that David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. He's talking about Goliath. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. And listen to what David says. David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And listen to what he says. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I called him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Listen to verse 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and the uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. You see, the Philistine, he was little compared to the lion and the bear. And you know what, dear friend? A lot of times we don't make it past the lion and the bear. You can have some lions and bears. And you know what? With God's help, you can defeat that lion and bear. 
You know what it'll do if you allow it? It'll get you ready for Goliath. Dear friend, Goliath's coming. Goliath's coming. You, you can count on it. I don't know what, 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 what form or shape it'll be in, but Goliath is coming. You see, the difference was David didn't go in his own power. Look what he said here. He said in verse 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And you know what he did, dear friend? He did that. I like these verses over in chapter, in the same chapter, verse 47. David said, in all, and we're, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 17, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and the spear. See, dear friend, you won't face Goliath with man-made weaponry. You, you, you will not be victorious over the lion and the bear with man's ideas. He says, and this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and spear. Look what he says. For the battle is the Lord's. For the battle is the Lord's. And look what he says. He will give you into our hands. And because he knew that, David wasn't defeated. He says, and it come to pass when the Philistine arose and came, drew, drew, uh, drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. You know, he wasn't like old Don Knotts. You ever seen old Don Knotts? <laughs> he'd go digging for that, 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 that the bullet and he'd get it in his gun and, and, and to shake his gun to west, his knees is knocking. You know what David done? He says, I have a God that I have already allowed to prove himself to me. Dear friend, if you'll allow him, listen, you'll have to allow him to prove it. Maybe it's drugs. Do you know he can deliver you from drugs? Maybe it's pornography. I read an article where some 77% of men now looks at pornography in some shape, shape or form. It's a shame. Stuff will rot your brain out. Listen, you know he can deliver you? Listen, David had no doubt, Brother Joe, he faced this to Goliath with all the confidence in the world. You know that we can face our problems and trials in this life with the same confidence that David faced this Goliath with, knowing that God's going to deliver us. He ran toward him. If you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. We'll look back here since we... I didn't know, I didn't know we was going to... Genesis chapter... Joseph is one of my favorite Bible characters. Joseph went through a lot. And as far as I know... There's not one statement in the Word of God. And you know, God, God really, if you look in the Bible, He didn't hide man, man's weaknesses from us. If, if they were there, He showed them to us so that we, you, you know, you can say, wow, He, you know, Abraham. Abraham went down into uh, Egypt and he lied about it. He said, yeah, that's my sister. I don't, I don't want them to scout me or take my head off. I, so, so, so even Abraham, a man of faith, had his failures. But Joseph and God let us know about those failures. And, and he done that for a reason. But in, Joseph, after everything that he went through, you don't find where he sat down in a corner and cried and say, oh me, oh my. You, you know, you, don't, you find nowhere in Scripture where he doubted God. You know what you'll find in Joseph? Joseph was sold into slavery, and I know you guys all know that. But do you know that even in that time, he was ripped from his family. He loved his dad. His dad loved him. He was ripped from his family. But God, even in the midst of his trials and afflictions, God blessed other people around him. Blows my mind. You know, in, in, in Genesis chapter 37, his brothers, of course, sold him. And we don't have time to read the whole account, of course. But they sold him. You know what went on. They got his coat, dipped it in blood, took it to their dad. And he, he thought a wild animal had, had, had gotten a hold of him. Uh, they sold him. Who'd they sell him to? The Ishmaelites. That's right. I couldn't come up with it. Look over in chapter 39. In verse, we'll read a couple of these verses in chapter 39. We're in Genesis chapter 39. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, uh, which had brought him down thither. Now look at verse 2. Now, now listen, his own brothers had done throwed him in a pit. Do you know that God 
could have delivered Joseph. God allowed this to happen to him. You need to understand that, okay? God allowed Joseph's brothers. Now, he didn't make his brothers do it, but he allowed them to do this to him, okay? Look what he says, and the Lord was with Joseph. And you say, well, Steve, how in the world was he with him? His brothers just threw him in a hole and sold him. He's done been sold again. How was he, how was he with him? Listen, dear friend, he was with him, just like he'll be with you through all your troubles, trials, and afflictions. The Bible says he was with him, and look what he says, and he was, pro he was a prosperous man. Kind of crazy, isn't it? He was a slave, Brother Joe, but he was a prosperous man. You know why he was prosperous? Because he had God with him. Because he had God with him. He says and in, he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And look at verse 3. And his master saw that the Lord was what? Was with him. You know what that means? Joseph didn't walk around the house saying, God just hates me. Ne never goes right for me. I got the worst luck in the world, but he wasn't doing that. You don't look at a man and say, hey, man, God's with that man and, and, them, and them all down in the dumps. You, that don't happen. Joseph was a man of God. And you know what Joseph knew? Joseph knew whatever came, whatever trial, whatever, whatever affliction, that he was going to be okay. Do you know why? Even though he was facing all these things, Brother Joe, he was right where God wanted him to be. And he knew that, and he was okay with it. Now, look what he says, that God was with him, and that the Lord made all, listen to this, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So he was a slave, but yet he was a blessed slave. Amen. He says, and Joseph found grace, and his master uh, saw that the Lord was with him. Uh, let's see, verse 4, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him and made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put in his hand. Uh, and it came to pass from that that he made him overseer of his house and over all that he had. Look, look at this. That the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for whose sake? For Joseph's sakes. For Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. You know what that tells me? That tells me in the midst of an affliction, a trial, that my family can be blessed. You understand what I'm telling you? Then the woman comes in the picture. That's enough? Oh, I messed it up. You know, I always tell them, Brother Joe, she wasn't an ugly woman. You say, Steve, how do you know that? How many rich men you ever seen marry an ugly woman? That's truth. You know what she was doing? She, that, that's, that's dossology right now. This wasn't just this ugly woman in there chasing Joseph around the house, okay? She had, probably, she had all of her teeth. She was a pretty woman. She didn't have any gaps, Nick. Now I'm going to tell you something. The average man, after he had just been through what he's been, see, he's sitting there thinking, you know what? This good-looking woman's chasing me, and I've been through so much. But you know what? He didn't give in. Look at his answer. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something, men. If Joseph would have stayed in that house, you know what would have wound up happening? He'd have sinned. Okay? And instead of running to it, you better be running from it. You understand what I'm telling you? See, listen. A man don't get up one morning and say, I'm going to cheat on my wife. Okay, you, you know how it happens? It happens slowly. That, that, that's how it happens. Uh, look, look what he says. She, 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 was, she was trying to seduce him. Uh, verse 12 says, And she called him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Now, Brother Joe, if he had been at outs with God, he's been down, beat up, you know, my brother sold me, crying all day, you know, then, then now, you, you know what, what would have happened? He, he'd have gave in right here. But that's not what Joseph done. Look over here. Look over here in, uh, where, am I, where am I looking for? He left his garments in her hand in verse 13. 
Verse 9. That's what we're looking for. Verse 9. This is his answer. There is none greater in this house than I, Joseph told her. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now listen, friend, if he'd have been mad with God and blaming God for this, he wouldn't have made that statement. You know what he'd have done? He'd have went in there and he'd fulfilled his fleshly desires. But that's not what Joseph done. That's not what he done. So, and I believe that Potiphar knew that he had a floozy at the house. Because, and you say, well, Steve, why? Because he didn't kill him. You know, he, he had to save face. You know, I can't let everybody know I married a floozy, so I might have to put, I might do something, so I'm, gonna put, I'm just going to put him in prison. So I, I, that's Doss thinking right there. Okay, don't, if you believe different, that's, that's fine. I, that's just what, that's what I get from it. The master took him, he put him in prison. Verse 21, now listen, he's been sold, been sold to Potiphar. <laughs> He's been, this, 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 this wild woman tried to seduce him. He said no. He's sitting in prison now. And look at, look, look at verse, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. Do, do you understand what I'm telling you this tonight? Just because you go through trials and tribulations and afflictions, dear friend, he's with you. If you're saved and have the Holy Spirit, now he's just as real as you allow him to be. He's just as real as this right here is to us. You know, when he gets ready to die, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord is a pretty comforting verse to me. It's inspired. People blow my mind. They say, well, Steve, how do you know that Bible's true? Dear friend, if he can create a universe out of nothing, speaking into existence, I don't have a problem, what, none whatsoever, believing that he preserved the Word of God for us. Not, not one little bit. He spoke this world into existence out of nothing. This is the Word of God. Verse 21, the Bible says, verse 21 says, but the, but the, the Lord was with Joseph, and <laughs> that's what he said, he showed him mercy. You say, well, good Lord, what do you mean he showed him mercy? He wasn't in hell. He wasn't in, you know what Joseph deserved? Jo he deserved hell just like I do. He says, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison committed to Joseph the hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did, he was the doer of it. Now look at verse 23. It says, the keeper of the prison looked not at anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, look what, look what it says, the Lord made it to prosper. In the midst of affliction and trials... Other people was getting blessed because of, because of Joseph. What a testimony. What a testimony. I think Joseph was sold into slavery when he was 17 years old. And I think, he, I think it was a 13-year process between when he saw his brothers again. I, is, is that sound right to you guys? I get those numbers mixed up sometimes. But anyways, this, this wasn't like it was a three-day trial, three-day journey. This, this is over 13 years. You know what, Brother Joe, it even gets worse. The bucker, the bucker, the butler and the baker show up. He interprets a dream. Look over in chapter uh, 40. And of course, uh, they hanged uh, the chief baker. But the butler went back to work and Joseph said, hey, remember me. How many years was it before he remembered him? <laughs> it was two full years. Two full years after all he's been through, he interprets his dream and now, you know, he, he just forgot about me. Eventually, he was remembered. And of course, you know, you know the account here in Genesis. If you would turn over because we're going to have, we can't, Genesis chapter 50. Get it in 50, I'm sorry. Look, look in Genesis chapter uh, 45. This is when he reveals himself to his brothers. And I'm going to tell you something. My brothers would have pitched me over in a hole. 
and sold me and I saw them 13 years later I don't know what I'd have done, Brother Owen. But see, I wouldn't have been right with God. Joseph was right with God. And, and uh, he had the mind of Christ. He had to. Uh, look at verse 5. He says, Now therefore be not grieved. He's talking to his brother. Nor angry with yourselves <laughs> that, you sold me, that you sold me hither. Now, now listen. This, Joseph, didn't, didn't, Joseph didn't do this because he was a good guy. Listen, Joseph did, did this because even though all these things happened to him, he knew who was in control. Listen, he knew that God had him right where he was supposed to be. Look at this. He says that you sold me hither, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in that which shall neither uh, be earing nor harvest. And look at verse 7. And God sent me before you to preserve you posterity in the earth and to save your lives by this great, by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. What does that tell us? He says, you didn't send me here. You know what he's saying? God allowed this to happen. You, dear friend, you know what? If you're here tonight and you've got cancer, and I, listen, I don't want cancer. But, if, but if, if I come down with cancer, do you know who allowed it? God did. Listen, I got to leave here some, sometime or another, and I don't, I, don't, I don't want cancer, and I don't want to leave here with cancer. But that's not for me to say. Or whatever the case may be. He says, so it was not you that sent, that, 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 that sent me hither, but God. And look what he says. And he, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all of his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Look over in, in, in Genesis chapter 50. Jacob passed away. His brothers were afraid. It's a man, Pop's gone. Joseph's facing to get his revenge now. You know what he does? He reconfirms it. In chapter 50 and verse 18, it says, His brother also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. Now look at verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for, I, for am I in the place of God. Now it took him 13 years to get there. A lot of trials and tribulations and probably laying in the bed thinking, man, I don't know what God's got next for me, but I'm here. You know where he was. He was in the place God had for him. That's exactly where he was. And he got there through trials, tribulations, you know, I, I talked to a lot of people said, man, I don't know what the will of God is. I don't know what the will of God is. You know, I found out there are things that we know we're supposed to be doing. Okay, listen, if you want to know what the will of God is, start doing the things you know you're supposed to do. People that holler that all the time, dear friend, they're not doing what they know they're supposed to be doing. You know you're supposed to be at church. You know you're supposed to be reading your Bible. You know you're supposed to be praying. You know you're supposed to be taking care of your pastor. You know you're supposed to be helping out around the church. Listen, if you want to know God's will, do the things that you, people's not serious about the will of God for their life. If you want to know the will of God, you start doing what you know you're supposed to do. And you know what he'll do? He'll show you. He'll show you exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, God that worketh in you both to will to do according to his good glory. That is exactly right. Amen. Yes, sir. We, 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 we understand. <clears throat> uh, we got time. Look in 2 Corinthians. So look in 2 Corinthians with me real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you know Paul the Apostle he had a thorn in the flesh. You know why he said he had that thorn in the flesh? Basically. Why did he have that thorn in the flesh? That's right. God strengthened him. You know, you know what he said? God gave him that thorn in the flesh basically to humble him. 
He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Verse 8 says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. He asked God three times to take it from him. And look at, look at the answer. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, sometimes when everything's going good for us, dear friend, we don't want to listen to God. We, we, we want to go do the things we want to do. And then he has to knock us down and to show us that, you know what? Without him, we're, we're really nothing. Look what Paul says. Most gladly, therefore, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That pretty much explains itself. He says, therefore, in verse 10, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches, necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then, he says, then am I strong. I got two verses I want to share with you in Psalms and I'm going to be finished. Psalm chapter 56. Psalm chapter 56. In verse 9. You know what David says? Psalm 56, 9, he says, When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. See, dear friend, he proved he was for us when he died for us. That's all the proof we need. Okay? Look in Psalm chapter 23 and we'll close. Psalm chapter 23 and verse 4. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff that comfort me. Listen, he's, he had not left you. If you're here, you're saved. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. We have trials and tribulations, dear friend, because he's trying to mold us and make us, make us a better Christian. Listen, he's trying to mold us for eternity, if we'll allow him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for loving us and dying for us. I thank you for all that you've done for us. And uh, I pray that you'd bless, bless this church. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd bless the rest of the service. We thank everybody that came out tonight, Lord, and I pray that you'd keep them safe as they go home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.